Hi, everybody. Um, so it's great to be back in Central Europe. I actually uh, lived just down the road in Budapest for uh, seven years, so this is almost home for me. Um, we started two companies in Budapest, and uh, both companies ended up listing on NASDAQ, and so most of my experience was across uh, running marketing for 10 years across these two companies. And the second one was Log Me In, and um, at Log Me In, I kind of toward the end, right as we were getting ready to, to file for the IPO, I, I started to look across these companies and uh, try to figure out, you know, did we just get lucky here or did we do some things that were really important to the long-term growth success of the company from the marketing side? And uh, what, I, what I came to the conclusion was that in the beginning, the first six months of execution in both businesses was really the most critical for driving growth in the long term. So I, when I left Log Me In, I moved to Silicon Valley and, uh, and actually focused on uh, just the first six months with, with several companies. And that's when I worked with Dropbox and Zobni and Eventbrite and uh, Lookout, so several companies, and, and basically tried to come up with a repeatable process for, for bringing these companies to market. And that's what I'm going to take you through today is just the, the process that I used in, in bringing these companies to market. So um, this is a really simple framework that I used, and it's, uh, I call it the startup marketing pyramid. Um, I know that uh, Ash spoke yesterday about getting to product market fit, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that, but that's the foundation of every great growth program is, is uh, product market fit. And then uh, I came in and, and tried to find companies that were already at product market fit and take them through a growth transition phase. And then um, once you have gone through this growth transition phase, uh, scaling growth becomes much easier and, and we'll go through some of the things that, uh, that I did with that. So this concept of product market fit is something that I've, I first heard about um, from reading Mark Andreessen's blog. Uh, he, he has since taken it offline, but I, I highly recommend going to archive.org and uh, looking at the, the secret blog posts of, of Mark Andreessen because they're, they're fantastic. And they, they basically, he kept talking about this concept of product market fit and he said basically all startups could be divided into pre-product market fit and post-product market fit. And until you have product market fit, you need to focus obsessively on getting to product market fit. And, uh, and so he was, he was fairly abstract on, on what that means. So I, I kind of boiled it down to the simple idea that a large group of people really need your product, really want your product. After they've used it, they consider it a must have. If, if they represent a, a big enough market opportunity, that's essentially product market fit. And I, I've taken it down to a few metrics even. Part of this was I, I knew as a marketer if I was gonna come in and work with a company, if they didn't have product market fit, I was, I was probably not gonna be very effective as the marketer. So I really wanted to monitor and find a way to, to verify or validate that they had product market fit. And I was able to take it down to a single uh, survey question. So they would have a few hundred uh, users, maybe just the early people using the product, and I would ask those users how they would feel if they couldn't use the product anymore. Really simple question, and I was looking for the users who said I would be very disappointed. So the, the choices I gave them were very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, not disappointed, not applicable, I don't use the product anymore, and I ignored everything. I ignored the somewhat disappointed. I ignored everything else. All I was looking for was the very disappointed. And I found that when companies got to about 40% of their users saying that they would be very disappointed, those companies tended to do pretty well. Those companies tended to have pretty marketable products. And if they were less than 40%, they, they needed to, to execute in a pretty different way. Um, so that, that's, that's really um, obviously a survey question is only half of it. If uh, people say they would be very disappointed without your product and then they never use it again, it's more important what they do than what they say in a survey. So, so you also want to look at usage. You want to look at how long they're using it, how, how frequently they're using it, if there's word of mouth. But kind of these things come together to tell you if you have product market fit. Uh, just, just a quick review on getting to product market fit. Um, even before you launch your product, you can, you can do some things here. So you can, you can make sure that the problem that you've set out to solve is actually 
a problem that people care about. If, uh, if that problem doesn't exist, then the solution to it's not really going to matter. So if you can just go and ask people if, if they're suffering from that problem and how important it would be to solve that problem. So that's, that's some of the things you can do before you even release your, your minimum viable product or, or MVP. Um, and then once you have the product out, that's when you want to essentially use that survey question, as I mentioned, or even just talk to people, find somebody who loves the product, try to understand why they love it, double down on the success, and just keep iterating on, on the positive signal of people who love the product. Um, I'm not really an expert on, on getting to product market fit, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. The area of, of preparing for growth once you have product market fit is where I have a lot of experience. And it's, it's kind of an interesting process here that, that basically what you need to do once you have a must-have product. So as we talked about, you got to build a must-have product first. But once you get to that point, then you really have to understand why is it a must-have product. You, you want to understand what the experience for people who, who can't live without your product, what experience are they having with your product? And if you, if you grasp that, you can, you can start focusing much more on creating a machine to deliver that value. So you want to make sure you set the right expectations. So build a, a promise that describes that experience. And you want to make sure that, um, that you build the right hooks to get people excited about having that experience. So that's sort of the hook and the promise are similar, but a little bit different. I'll explain that in a little bit. And then ultimately, you want to optimize the flows. So, so get as many people to reach that must-have experience who, who kind of start on your website, who, who come into your environment. So there's a few ways that we can start to, to, to get this understanding. So f first is back to that original question that I talked about. Finding the people who would be very disappointed without your product, they hold the keys to building this value delivery machine. So asking that question, how would you feel without this? Concentrating on the people who give you the answer, I would be very disappointed. Then you want to drill into those people and understand the benefit that they're getting from the product. So the way I like to do this is starting with just open-ended. So get 15, 20 people to write in what benefit they get from the product, and then look for patterns within there and break it down to more multiple choice answers for the next group of people that you survey. So essentially crowdsourcing your multiple choice questions. And once you have three or four kind of distinct benefits that people are getting, then, then give people the ability to choose one of those benefits. And so again, you're looking at people who can't live without your product and trying to find the benefit that is most common for those people. And then the last thing is I, I try to find out the context of why that benefit is important to them. So for people who chose that benefit, I ask the question of why did you select this as your favorite? And there's a lot of data in startups. There's, there's kind of too much data coming at you a lot of times. But this is data that is super useful. If you get 50 responses from people who can't live without your product that have gravitated toward the same benefit that they're getting from it, and you read just the write-ins of why that benefit is important to them, there's, there's gold in those answers. That's going to give you a lot of really insightful information, not just on marketing, but on, on extending your product and the product roadmap. Um, but once you have that information, then the next thing you want to do is really optimize your value delivery machine on that. So you, you basically just want to get the most number of people who hit your website to get to that experience. And the way you do that is increase the desire. So if you have a strong promise related to, to an effective hook, you're going to create momentum coming in. And then you want to reduce friction. So you want to figure out any confusing parts, any parts that, that are kind of broken and not working very well in the conversion process. And if you have strong momentum and low friction, then you have a high conversion rate. So it's a really simple formula. Desire minus friction equals conversion rate and build desire, reduce friction. So how do you do that? Again, surveys can be really helpful in kind of getting to the heart of what's, what's happening. So the first thing that I try to figure out is intent. So intent is this, this really powerful thing for marketers to work with. It, if somebody has intent, they, they really want something. And if you don't tap into that intent, you're not going to do a very effective job converting them. So just hitting people on your website now, you don't have to do this for a very long time, but just for one day of being able to find out what is the primary purpose of your visit today, 
for example, as they come to the website, you'll start to understand what they were looking for. And it's not always exactly what your product does, but it's, you, you essentially need to find a way to connect that intent to the promise of the benefit that your product delivers. So that's one area where you, that's going to be some useful information. I'll show you how to use that in a minute. And then the second is identifying those points of friction. So user testing is super effective for this. Um, you can use something like usertesting.com, where you, where you can bring in external panels of people to try signing up for your product and just look for those points of confusion. Or I mean, we even have had people come to our office trying to sell us something. And I tell them, I'll hear their pitch if I can film them trying our product. So you, you, can, you can go to a mall and film people. There's, there's, different ways that you can do these user tests. But in those user tests, they're really effective for figuring out confusing parts within your product. And then um, you can also ask some questions. So you can say, um, is there anything preventing you from signing up for our service today? If they say yes, then you can, again, start with an open-ended question to see what what's their concern is. And then after you get some ideas, then you can start to, to provide multiple choice questions, maybe with an other that, that opens it up. But again, with this type of information, you're just getting ideas of what's going on, qualitative ideas. And then what you want to do is apply those qualitative ideas to uh, quantitative testing. So you want to be able to A-B test lots of different headlines to, to try to see what, what drives good momentum. And um, when you do that, you, you can test the headlines in a lot of different ways to, to maximize conversion. What, the mistake that a lot of people make with A-B testing is that they they uh, do all kinds of tests where eventually they may actually take headlines that have nothing to do with their product, but they get a good response. So they're setting the wrong expectation when someone comes in. So what you, what you need to do is make sure that you also have a promise that's very true to your must-have experience. So what I like to do is kind of double stack a headline, so a good hook followed by a promise that's true to the must-have experience, and then testing combinations of that, and then uh, testing different flows to reduce the friction and maximize the number of people who get to the must-have experience. And then one other trick is obviously to reduce the steps to get to the must-have experience. So, so actually, if you, can, if you can have that aha moment very early in the conversion process, people are uh, more likely to effectively um, convert. So if you can get them to that experience, that's where all the value happens in the business. If they don't reach that experience, and I learned this at Log Me In when we, we tried to grow the business and we had a, we had a very um, challenging conversion funnel. So if you think about Log Me In, you actually have to sign up for the service, download software, install that software, configure your firewall to make sure that it's, it's not blocking access, go to a different computer, log in through there, and then finally you get the great experience of a remote control session. But as you can imagine that every additional step, there's lots of people who fall out. So when we first tried to grow the business, there were very few people who actually got to that remote control session. Our registration numbers were great, but our, our actual um, growth rate was, was not so strong because clearly somebody who doesn't use the product is not gonna become a habitual loyal user. They're not gonna share uh, the, the product and tell other people about it, and they're not going to buy from us. So uh, each of these things are really correlated to a great usage of the product. So when we went through this process over and over and kept optimizing and optimizing the conversion and understanding why people weren't taking the next steps and drove the A-B testing, we went back and tested channels that previously scaled to a few thousand dollars a month and with a positive return on investment we went back and tested those same channels and could spend over a million dollars a month and had a, had a positive return on investment. So this, this is um, kind of very detailed. I know it's not as exciting as what are the great channels out there, but if you don't do this, the great channels don't really matter. So you, you need to have a must-have product. You need to have a value delivery machine to get people to that must-have experience, and then channels might work for you. They're still going to be hard. So that's, that's when you can scale growth. So um, a few things to think about when you're, I, mean, I want to kind of go through some principles first because 
how you grow each business is, is probably gonna be pretty different, so it's better to kind of think through some of these principles first before we go through specific tactical ways to grow a business. So creativity, obviously, you have to have ideas to, to figure out something that's going to work, and some people are more creative than other people, but in my experience, spending lots of time with your users in direct conversations, lots of surveying, lots of engagement with your users triggers really good ideas. My best ideas always come from spending a lot of time with, with customers. Um, testing is, is really, you never know what's gonna work and what's not going to work, so you wanna do lots of testing. It's really the, the quality of the tests dictate the success to some degree, but it's also the velocity of the tests. If you do, if you test 10 things, one will work better than the other nine, and the only way to know which is the best is to do all 10, and so you have to just keep this, this high velocity of testing going. And then uh, when something works, double down on it. Really figure out um, why it's working and, and try to replicate it and scale it and expand it. So these are high-level principles, and then there's these principles of growth hacking that, um, so I was at a uh, growth hacker conference in Silicon Valley on Friday, and the head of growth at uh, Facebook was there, the head of growth at Twitter, at LinkedIn. There was, there was really good, um, a really good exchange of, of ideas and information, and a lot of them came, to, came down to these, these principles that really are critical for driving growth. First is you, you really want to leverage engineering into your growth. So I, I did this in my first startup um, was uh, Uproar.com out of Budapest, and we were competing against uh, Sony. They, had, uh, they were a top 10 advertiser on the internet. They had, um, they, they had the most popular game shows on television, and those game shows we're cross-promoting their internet properties. So that was our one competitor, and we're a lightly funded company out of Eastern Europe. Not, not very easy to compete against them. Our other big competitor was Yahoo. Yahoo, at that time, controlled, basically was the portal to the internet, so they could channel traffic wherever they wanted. So these were our two big competitors, and we're this distant company that could never compete spending dollars against them. But what we did was we had really good games and very talented engineers. So our goal was to take that, that value that we were able to create and, and leverage that to be able to compete against these guys. So we, we actually made games that were easy to replicate and spread to other websites and put a add this game to your website and then actually paid them for the traffic that they referred, had a very engaging path that led into our website. So a game would start somewhere else and, and eventually they would be playing a game on our website. And um, using this approach, we were able to actually, we got the game on 40,000 websites and we're actually able to become the number one game site in the world against companies that we had no business even competing against. So leveraging engineering, this concept of growth hacking has been around for a long time. That was the mid 1990s. So um, I think the best companies today are, are using a lot of these things. You wanna leverage your user base to get more users. The, the challenge that I, one of the challenges I had at Log Me In was that we, um, our, a lot of our growth was based on spending money. It was spending money with a positive return on investment, but when you get to millions and millions of users every month signing up, finding new pla places to spend money to drive growth become harder and harder. So when I got to Dropbox, I was really focused on avoiding that problem, and we were able to, from day one, build a growth engine that was really having lots of users, and those users got more users, and those users got more users, and today, um, this is the growth curve of Dropbox, and it's, it's been really effective, and they, I, I don't think there's any stopping them in terms of that growth, because it's all based on very passionate users spreading that growth. Um, so, spreadable experiences, I, I talked about the games on other sites, is, is, is part of the advantages of the internet, so really it's about understanding the advantages of the internet, to, to drive your growth, and then this obsessive optimization. I talked about for the funnel optimization, but you, you wanna do optimization for every single channel that you do, especially when something works, you wanna keep, keep optimizing it and make it work better. Um, so this is the last, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, I wanna open up for a good 10 minutes of, of question and answer, um, but I'll, I'll just touch on these things. This is kind of the testing order that I go through when I'm, when I'm looking at a new company. Um, 
virality is a great place to start because if it works, it's very cheap and you can grow very quickly. I would just make sure that if you're, if you're building virality, think of that value delivery engine. If, if, if you're just driving signups that drive other signups, you're not creating value, and that's, that's what causes a lot of companies to, to fall off a cliff and, and not be effective. Um, and then channels that don't cost money are another good place to start. So search engine optimization. This, the two and three both kind of feed off of this idea that um, somebody who already wants your solution, you want to make sure that they can find your solution. Search engine optimization is a free way or a or way that doesn't cost very much money if you, if you bring in a consultant. Um, and that's one way to, to, to uh, show up when somebody's looking for your product. Directories, just anywhere somebody might look for your product, you want to make sure you can be found. Sometimes you can be there for free. Sometimes you need to pay to be there. But it's important to be in those places. Other, other kind of low cost, scalable things you want to ex uh, experiment with. And then really the last part is, is demand generation, trying to impulsively convert people who don't even know they want your product. But that's hard. That's everything from banner advertisements to radio and television and billboards. And um, that, that's really hard to make work. So try all the other channels first. So that's it. Um, should we open it up for some questions? Who wants to catch the catch box? You have it in your eyes already. <laughs> oh, they're waiting for you, so go. Sure. All right, next one. You, just saw it. So uh, I'm interested, you showed Dropbox uh, growth graph, right? Uh -huh. There were some parts where you, you, I think, marked some events in that graph, right? Where you had like, the, the letters of the events. That, that was actually a Google Trends oh, it was a Google search. Trend. Search up, so they, they tend to put like big press releases and things like that. That's right. what those numbers were. But, but do, do, you, so do you feel in these cases like the drove drivers were basically optimizing the experience, or what, do you, what were like these like events basically, or that, that changed it basically? At the core, when I first got to Dropbox, there was already this passionate little group. I I, uh, I joined Dropbox the week they launched at um, at TechCrunch uh, TechCrunch 50, I think it was 40, I don't know. Um, and. Uh, they, that, that small group was very passionately spreading the word already. And, um, and then after that, we, we basically took, there was different types of paths that you could come in. So some people were looking at Dropbox in, in an individual experience to sync their files. And that was the primary use case where there was a lot of word of mouth. But other people were coming in through shared folders. So there was some built-in virality that way. And so it, basically what we wanted to do in each of those cases was really try to understand the user's intent and perception and make sure that we had a very smooth flow to a great experience with, with each of those. And then within that first six months was when the, uh, somebody else on the team actually came up with the um, referral program that was really effective. But again, I don't think I think a lot of people look at that referral program and just want to copy it. You get, you get free space if you recommend Dropbox. I, I think the important thing is that people were already recommending Dropbox. People love Dropbox, and that's an accelerate, accelerator on something that was already working. I think a lot of times people want to try to put an incentive on, on a company where there's not really already good natural word of mouth, and it, it probably wouldn't work as well. So hopefully that answers your question. All right, let's do a test. You try to kick it back until it reaches the right person. <laughs> back or there? Yeah, yeah. Crowdsource catching works. <laughs> um, then what I have from meetings. Uh, one thing I noticed when I asked my users the question, um, how disappointed would you be if you would no longer be able to use the service? was that some of those users reacted uh, that uh, they actually thought that the service was going to go away and they, when I discussed with them after the survey, uh, they started actively looking for an alternative, although that was not the reason. So my question is, why not use the sort of net promoter score of uh, how likely it is to, for you to recommend this service to a colleague or a friend? So why did you uh, sort of uh, architect the survey uh, through the negative emotion? Oh. So um, 
One, uh, I'm gonna, uh, there's kind of multiple things within that question. The first is, uh, I find it a very good sign when people are worried from that question because that means that they're pretty passionate about the solution. Sometimes people say, don't worry, we're not going anywhere. They'll, they'll actually put with that question, so I'd, I'd recommend that if, if you get any of that signal back. Um, net promoter score, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, is basically asking someone the likelihood that they would recommend your product on a scale of one to 10, and if you know, 10 being very likely, one being or zero being that they wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it at all. Um, the challenge with that question is that you may have a must-have product, but really bad customer service, and so somebody wouldn't recommend your product because of some, some of your business practices, but it's still a must-have product. So I think actually long-term, Net Promoter Score is a great business execution that helps you execute the business 360 degrees and get everything working right to create passionate customers who refer your product. But in the beginning, your number one goal is to get to the product being a must have. Like none of those other things matter until your product is a must have. And this is a good way to get there. I, I originally phrased it as a negative because it, I was at Zodney and I was asking people's satisfaction ratings on the product and they mostly had managers and directors that were their, their customers. And when you ask managers and directors a satisfaction question, they're always somewhat satisfied because they, they always want it to be improved. But when you ask, OK, what would happen if you couldn't use this anymore? Damn it, I would be pissed off. Like they, they, they gave a much more honest answer on the take it away from them. But once I, once I ran it across a lot of companies, and, and particularly if I ask the question and say, why? you could see really interesting insights. So a lot of times, somebody who picks, I would be somewhat disappointed, they write, because I would just use product X instead. So the product may be a must have, but there's replacement products, so it's not differentiated enough. So there, there's just really good context in that question. Um, but I'm sure there's a better one if you want to come up with it. But that's the best one that I've found. Thank you very much, Ted uh, my, my question about it. And by the way, survey of IO has been a really helpful uh, you're welcome. So survey.io is, is basically a, uh, a, a place where we have put together about 10 questions. I think it, maybe it's eight questions, but it really helpful. It was what I originally used to get my head around each business, and then I just made it available for free working with Kissmetrics. Um, so do we have any more questions? Oh, no. <laughs> OK, well, I'll be around uh, tonight, so come up to me and ask me. It's pro probably more specific to your business, so it's, uh, it's harder to ask it in a group yeah. format. Um, but look forward to talking with some of you tonight. All right, give it up for Charlie.